sometimes. Um, and staff don't like that. There's a long history of this happening in London. I could give you a lot of examples. But really, it shouldn't surprise us because counselors actually respond to a different set of incentives than staff. Um, staff tend to think about policy in a long-term sense. They tend to think about long-term impacts. They tend to be cautious and conservative about what they propose. They draw on their own professional expertise and training as planners, as engineers, as social service professionals, and so on. Um, but counselors, of course, are concerned about re-election, and it seems there's always another election around the corner. And this means that they're concerned about maintaining support from key constituencies in the city. So who are those key constituencies? Well, in theory, there are a lot of them. You know, in some ways, local government is very open. This means, because it's, lower, uh, because it's smaller in scale than other levels of government, your representatives are relatively more easily accessible. Um, because there are no political parties, your representatives aren't beholden to party platforms. So in many ways, local government is very accessible to people, but uh, not everybody has an equal voice when you look at the actual practice of local government. Um, and this is where the property taxes come in. The most important voices, not only in London, but generally in local government in North America, uh, tend to be developers, business owners, and homeowners. Um, and the reason why is simple is that these are the property owners. Um, well, I perhaps should say we are the property owners. Certainly I am a homeowner, probably many of you are as well. And those of us who own property in the city of London have a voice that it carries more weight than those who don't. Um, because local government relies on property taxes, it needs a strong property tax base. So responding to the interests of those of us who own property is very important. And also, those of us who own property are much more motivated to get engaged in local politics because you know, we're paying for it. We pay directly through our property taxes. Folks who don't own property, renters, they effectively pay through their rent too, but they don't pay directly, right? Because it's their landlords that do the paying. And, and so those of us who pay property taxes directly tend to be more involved, on average, in local politics. They tend to get more engaged in the issues. And again, this is not something that's unique to London. It's the norm across North America. Um, and of course, serving property and property owners is a very important part, a critical part, of what local government is supposed to do. But the fact that property owners have this really dominant role in setting the agenda does sometimes produce problems as well. Um, for one thing, the, the interests of particular property owners don't always align with the broader, what makes sense for the city more broadly. So for example, developers find it easier to develop land on the edge of the city. There's large open plots available. You don't have to fight with neighbors about what you're going to build. Um, but this leads to a city, as it has in London, that's continually growing outward um, and leaving unused and underused infrastructure behind in the older parts of the city. There's cost implications to that, and there's other implications to that. Um, I'll give you another example. Homeowners associations in many of London's established neighborhoods have successfully resisted the siting of new social services and social service agencies, social assistance agencies in their neighborhoods. Um, this has arguably served their interest, um, but it's also led to a real concentration of social services in London in, in just a couple of locations, notably downtown and Old East, and those are locations that historically have not had strong and active um, residents and ratepayers associations. And so there's ways in which people exercise their voice and, their, and, and, you know, and push for their own interests in local politics and government and pursue their own interests that doesn't necessarily align with, with what might be best for the city more broadly. Now, I don't want to overstate all of this here. Different councillors do respond very differently to the incentives that face them. Um, and the city, of course, does at times pay attention to the interests of those who don't own property. It runs subsidized recreation programs, it promotes housing affordability in certain neighborhoods by zoning for multifamily rentals, and so on and so on. Uh, but more often than not, programs and services and regulations that benefit non-property owners either come as a result of provincial, provincial mandates or through the initiative of city staff, not so much through the initiative of political representatives. 
So my point here is that local government is in many ways very open to public input, but not everybody has the same kind of say, and some segments of society are more influential and more organized than others. So with that background in mind, whoop, I'd like to just share a few thoughts on how London might address the issues that I mentioned at the start. And the first issue here is restoring trust in politicians. Um, and, and I think you all know about the things that have damaged the reputation of city council probably in the last few years. Council has been bitterly divided on key issues. One group of councillors was repeatedly investigated by the Ontario Ombudsman for meeting behind closed doors to discuss policy. This ties back to what I was talking about before. And of course, to top it all off, Joe Fontana was convicted of fraud and breach of trust, not for things he did while mayor, but for things he did while federal MP. Um, and many of the people that I talk to seem to uh, have come to the conclusion this is just the tip of the iceberg and that there's some kind of deep-seated corruption and perhaps incompetence as well at City Hall. And, and the good news is that I don't see any evidence that this is the case. Now, London has had divided councils in the past as well. That's not new. And that's actually not unusual in city politics in Ontario because we don't have political parties. It's hard to hold those coalitions together. And divides are very common. You, you go to many other cities and it's a similar story. But at the risk of oversimplifying, I think much of the pro problem over the last few years boils down to two words, Joe Fontana. Um, now I hate to point fingers, but I obviously am pointing fingers. Um, the basic problem here is not his criminal conviction, although that obviously didn't help things. Um, the basic problem is that Fontana tried to import a federal pol political style into local politics. Um, he came to the mayor's chair after many years of being in federal politics where he was used to sitting in closed door caucus meetings deciding on policy and then bringing it to the floor. And that's exactly what he tried to do here in London. He tried to build a mini caucus of loyal supporters, meet with them outside of council meetings, develop uh, platforms, and then come to council and vote as a block. Um, and this is not how municipal politics is meant to work. And so uh, it created a backlash. It created a backlash from other councillors who were excluded from this inside circle, hence the bitter divides. Um, and it also sparked a backlash from the ombudsman, and the ombudsman several times investigated and twice found the, this particular group of councillors guilty of meeting illegally to discuss policy outside of council. So does the departure of Fontana then solve this problem? Well, no, of course, not on its own. If you, if you break down trust in public officials, it takes a while to rebuild it. Um, New faces on council might provide an opportunity for a new start, but what's important is what new politicians actually do. And ultimately, I think a lot boils down, at least in my view, to the kinds of people that we elect. I think what we need on this front is two things. First of all, we need a mayor who is adept at leading and achieving consensus in public and on the council floor, not in the back rooms. Um, and we need councillors as well, who are committed to engaging with all of the residents in their wards, not just the squeaky <laughs> wheels, to bring more people into the conversation and to create a closer tie between council and constituents. There's other things we can do too, but uh, like regulations, and that's something we could talk about in Q&A. Uh, but really, I think it boils down a lot to the quality of the people that we elect. Um, and, Make no mistake, I think there are good quality candidates out there in this election, um, both at the mayoral level and in just about all of the wards. So it's not like we don't have any choices in this respect. Oop. Issue number two, a bloated local government. Um, now, this is this idea that Londoners are overtaxed and local government is wasteful. And, and this kind of claim, while it's not baseless, is kind of ubiquitous. It's very common in municipal elections. I think we'd be hard pressed to find an Ontario municipality right now where somebody isn't making the claim that there's overspending and waste and we need to do something about it. Um, it's a tried and tested way for municipal politicians who want to gain popular support to try to gain it. And in part this is, as I note up there, because the property tax is very highly visible. This means, you know, most of us get our income taxes um, deducted 
at the source. So we've got, you know, we've got a steady income of one source or sort or another. The income taxes are deducted off the top at the beginning. That's certainly what happens for me. Um, your property tax comes as one big chunky bill. Oh my goodness, I owe $3,600. So the property tax is very visible and it makes people very sensitive to the level of the property tax, more so than they are to the level of the income tax, for example. Um, now, the question is whether overtaxation and waste are actually problems in London. Um, and, and let's consider the overtaxation thing first. Now, in one sense, you really can't judge this objectively because whether or not we think we're paying too much in property taxes depends in part on how much we think governments should be doing. After all, we, we have to pay for what we get, right? So, so our beliefs about the role of government and how much it should and should not be doing play a role here. But what we can do is we can look at where London stands in terms of property tax levels when we compare it to other Ontario municipalities. Um, these numbers are a little small for those of you in the back again, but the basic point here is this is, this is a comparison of uh, property taxes levied on an average single detached home in Ontario municipalities that have more than 100,000 people. The reason why this is a good comparison is that very small municipalities often don't deliver the range of services that bigger ones do. So the tax levels there are different. Um, and there's London right there, kind of in the mid to low range. Um, you can see Sudbury is the lowest sort of overall municipality. Tor the city of Toronto is divided into four sections for reasons that I don't need to discuss. Uh, they have to do with the methodology of this, um, of this report. But basically, so we, we are sort of middling to low in terms of tax burden in relation to other Ontario municipalities. And that's way, one way to, to look at this. So, you know, in that sense, not particularly overtaxed. I mean, local government isn't free, but, you know, nothing is, right? Um, so what about the argument about waste then? Um, well, again here, I think in one sense it's difficult to judge because one person's waste is another person's public value. Um, so, you know, for example, I don't know how many of you love the metal trees downtown in London and how many of you think they're a complete waste of taxpayers' money, but opinions are divided. Um, I've seen people you know, arguing on both sides of that one. Uh, it's a bit of a, a frivolous example, but the point is that our values influence uh, what, what we actually think is waste and what isn't. Um, now, on the other hand, we can say about London that it's taken part in some comparative service quality assessments with other Ontario municipalities a little while. And the results of these suggest that the city is actually quite efficient for a large public organization. And I've got to give you that caveat because large public organizations always are a bit inefficient. For a large public organization compared to other municipalities, it delivers pretty good value for dollar. Um, and because since the early 1990s, local governments have faced, faced tremendous and ongoing pressure to keep taxes down, there has been for 20 years a search, a continual search for more efficiency in local government. Um, there is room for more of that. But by and large, London's local government does pretty well with what it has. Um, now, so, so in many ways, I think this issue of a bloated local government is a bit of a red herring. But there's one important caveat from my perspective here. And this has to do with police and fire wages. Um, almost 30%, one third of our property taxes now go to these two essential services. And that's a proportion that's increased hugely over the last 20 years. The main driver of that is very high and rapidly increasing salaries. Um, for a little bit of you know, actual context here, the, the present day salary for a first class constable in London starts at $87,000 plus benefits and goes up from there. Um, firefighters, 80% of London firefighters last year made more than $100,000. Um, now, don't get me wrong, you know, these folks do critical work and they need to be well paid for it. But the fact that police and fire salaries are more than double, more than double the average salaries in the rest of local government in London should should lead us to, you know, conclude that there's something wrong going on here. Um, and the main source of this problem actually is not local in a way. It's not local labor negotiations. Some of you might know this. What happens is our essential workers have no right to strike. 
And so when they negotiate with their municipal employers and they can't come to an agreement, they go to a provincial arbitration hearing. And our provincial arbitration system is, according to many people, including myself, broken in the sense that provincial arbitrators settle these disputes based on the best conditions that are available somewhere else in the province. And so police and firefighters are always leveling up in terms of working conditions. And this le has led to tremendous inflation in police and fire wages. So this is not something that our new London representatives can address alone. But what they can do, what they should be doing, is allying with other municipalities um, in order to try to convince the province that it's high time to change the arbitration system. Um, because municipality, municipal ability to pay needs to be taken into account. So when we talk about waste, when we talk about overspending in local government, that's the big issue that I see in London. It's not one that's got a lot of traction so far in this election campaign, partly because as a city on our own, we can't do all that much about it. But it is something that needs attention. Now, let's turn to the third issue that I mentioned at the beginning. That's uh, nurturing the local economy. At election time, local politicians are always tempted to make wild promises about future prosperity. Four years ago, Joe Fontana promised to create 10,000 jobs while he was mayor. Of course, it didn't happen. And, and, and unfortunately, that kind of promise is doomed from the start. It's not that he promised it, he could have done it, but he just wasn't really good enough to do it. Um, he cannot do it. Local government cannot directly uh, create jobs. Unless, of course, it hires more people, which then leads to the bloat and waste thing we were just talking about, right? So, so we, could, we could get 10,000 jobs in London instantly if we tripled property taxes and hired 10,000 municipal workers, but nobody thinks that that's a sensible idea. So local government can't, on its own, create jobs. Um, in fact, a lot of the bigger picture fundamentals that shape London's economy are not under local control at all. So beware of candidate promises to you know, do certain things, accomplish certain economic goals. Um, after several years of struggling, London's economic fortunes have begun to turn around in the last few months. And some of you have probably read about this. But this has almost nothing to do with what local government's been doing. The economic upturn has been driven by large-scale factors like the upswing in the US economy and the low Canadian dollar, because our economy is very linked to the American economy. Um, so if the big picture drivers of the economy are actually not under local control, can local government do anything about this? You know, when we're talking about economic development, economic development, is it all just smoke and mirrors? Well, well no, it's not. There are things that local government can do you know, within the constraints of broader economic conditions, which it cannot control. <laughs> the traditional approach to trying to assure economic development and economic prosperity in a place like London, and this is very much the dominant approach to date in London, is to try to attract business from elsewhere. And municipalities in North America are always doing this. They're trying to siphon off business from one place to, to where they are. Right? So, so trying to attract companies from the US to Canada, from Waterloo to London, from Guelph to Toronto. And uh, usually, the gist of this strategy involves doing things like preparing infrastructure, such as service land, and providing tax breaks and other incentives to try to attract businesses that will come from elsewhere. Now, there is a place for this kind of strategy, but it needs to be used carefully. And there are pitfalls, too. First of all, not all large businesses are particularly good for the economic future of a city. For example, it's very hard for me to see how spending millions of dollars on land servicing to attract another Walmart that's going to employ minimum wage people who are probably going to lose jobs elsewhere that are already minimum wage has, you know, does anything much for the local economy in the longer run. So some investments are more attractive than others. Some investments are better than others. Um, but there are risks nonetheless, because large businesses tend to be mobile. So you can attract them, and then somebody else can attract them away. Um, so there's a real risk in the end that if we engage in business attraction as our main sort of long-term local economic development strategy, 
that we're going to end up engaging in a race to the bottom with other municipalities. We'll offer you service land. No, we'll offer you service land plus a million dollar tax break, you know, a bidding war over businesses, which in the end doesn't benefit anybody. Um, now, there is an alternative strategy for attra to attracting investment from the outside, and I'm not saying it's a replacement, but it's something that has a sort of different focus. Um, and this is to support homegrown and small business. And this is something that local government is very well placed to do. Um, it's not something that London has focused on as a big part of its strategy in the past. But interestingly, it is something that all four of the mayoral candidates right now are talking about. And I think that's a good thing. Because a local strategy has several advantages over business attraction. Um, first of all, it's relatively low cost. Since the businesses are already here, or they're starting up here, they do not need to be attracted. So instead of spending money attracting them, you can spend money nurturing and supporting them um, through things like build, building renovation subsidies, tax abatement for small businesses, forgiving development charges for small businesses that want to expand, and so on. It's also a more stable strategy, because homegrown businesses tend to be more likely to stay in, a, in the place that they started in, in the longer term. And finally, this kind of strategy means that more of the wealth produced by business stays and circulates in the local economy rather than being sent off to corporate headquarters somewhere else. Um, so there are advantages to a local business incubation focus. Um, but there is one other thing that I just want to talk about, and this leads into my final point. Let me see how I'm doing for time here. Um, yeah, I'm fine. OK, yeah, I'm probably going to take about five or six more minutes to wrap things up here. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is smart land use planning. Now, that sounds like an empty slogan. What do I mean by smart? Well, we can unpack that more as we go on. Um, the key really here is land use planning. Land use planning is absolutely critical to the economic future of London as it is to the economic future of any city. Um, it's one of the key powers that local government in London does have. This is the power to plan and determine what gets built, where, under what condition, buildings, infrastructure, parks, roads, commercial buildings, housing subdivisions, all of that. And in any given year, the impact of planning regulations on the shape of the city isn't all that big. So you get a few new buildings here, a new subdivision there, a new bike lane here, nothing changes radically. But the impact of planning is over the long term. Over many years, there we go, um, over a period of many years, the impact of a certain set of planning regulations on the shape of a city is enormous. How the city is built shapes our sense of collective identity, our pride in the city we have, or our lack of pride if we don't like the way it looks. It shapes all kinds of things. Over the years, it helps to shape the options that are available for housing for people, whether it's all single family, how many apartments there are, whether housing is close to shops and businesses or far away from them. It, help, it determines how people get around, whether we need to all get in our cars and drive everywhere because everything is very sp spread out, or whether there are other options. Um, all of these and other factors, um, all of these and other things are, are shaped over the long term by planning practice. The quality of an environment is affected. Whether we live socially segregated or socially integrated, socially mixed, that's affected as well. And all of these things, in turn, I think make up what we could call the livability of a city. In other words, the extent to which London is an attractive city for people to live in and to work in. So determining what kind of city we consider attractive, what kind of city we want, and putting in place the planning regulations to build that city over the long term. It's not going to happen in a year, not going to happen in 10 years, but it will happen in 2030. Um, that's absolutely fundamental to ensuring a sustainable economic future for the city. Um, and it's not just that. It's also a way to build, if we want to build, a social inclus socially inclusive city, a just city, a city that provides space, literally provides space, for people from all walks of life to live, to work, to travel, to play. And so this then brings me to 
a couple of reflection, reflections on this thing called the London Plan. How many of you have heard of the London Plan? I'm just curious. Most of you. OK, well, that's fantastic, because that's a much better ratio than you know, my students, I think. Uh, <laughs> now, so the London Plan is the uh, city's official draft plan. And the city, I don't know if you know this. You may know this. The city only produces an official plan, a new official plan, once every 25 years. Um, Every five years, they do a review of the existing official plan, which can sort of adjust things at the margin. But really, a new direction for the city is set once every 25 years. And this is the stage we're at right now. We have a draft official plan now that was produced over the past three years through a, a, a participatory process called Rethink London that I imagine a few of you at least were involved in. Statistically speaking, probably a few of you had to be involved in it because they involved about 10,000 people in this process in one way or another. The process was run by city planners. Um, and the results were quite striking. Uh, according to the new draft plan, most Londoners want the city to grow less outwards and more inwards and upwards. They want continued support for downtown revitalization, something that the city has starting to have some success on after about 10 years of trying. Um, they want more infill development in existing neighborhoods. This is what the plan says. They want more sp small business spaces, more diverse housing options. They want stronger public transit. All of these things and more form the foundation of a new official plan that proposes a really big departure from how London's been evolving up to now. And I encourage you to all take a look at the plan. The, the front page of the website looks like that. And you can scroll through either in just a little detail or in a lot of detail if you're interested. And some of you probably have already done this. Um, I don't necessarily think that personally that everything that I see in this plan is going to happen, um, that everything necessarily is ideal. But in my view, it's a sound document. It's grounded in public opinion. It's grounded in good planning practice. And I think perhaps its greatest asset is that instead of constantly moving London's growth away from what we have, which is what's been really the pattern to date, this plan suggests that we got to build on what we already have, which is a beautiful city full of vibrant neighborhoods with a strong sense of history and a so strong sense of place. So it's turning towards rather than away from that. And why this is important is that deciding on the future of the London plan is one of the first tasks before the new council after the election. Um, uh, it may not get approved. Developers are complaining that it proposes too radical a shift away from suburbs. Um, and homeowners associations in some existing neighborhoods are concerned about potential increases in density. So there is going to be debate. There's probably going to be some revision. But in my view, it really does form the foundation for a livable and attractive London in the long term, one that we can be proud of and that will encourage those who are here to stay and draw new residents and businesses. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. And uh, I'd be happy to talk, among other things, in Q&A about how our various mayoral candidates stack up in light of this stuff that I've been talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Too over time, did I? Actually, that was pretty good. <laughs> so are you? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hart. Um,